All right, so let's uh, start actually, and I'm recording this for future reference. So we're good. You guys can hear me on the other side, right? Yes, I can hear you, Will. Okay. Good. So yeah, so what we wanted to do today was to go over. Uh, right now, here we we've built some of the 3D printers. We're working on actually printing parts for the torch table, so that's um, that's kind of the bootstrapping route. Start with a small machine like the 3D printer. You can print the universal axis, 3D printed pieces for a larger machine like the torch table, or a large router, or anything else, any larger scale machine. So that's what we're doing. Uh, the work doc is. Let me share my screen actually. So. Share screen. Work doc is if you want to go to my log, which is March and log, you can go to CNC torch table link to 20, uh, 21.08. So concept design. So let's start with this doc here. So um, I'll paste this just so you can reference it and then share it's editable let me see make sure it's editable by everybody so we can actually collaborate on it in there as well anyone can find an edit specifically in the chat i'm typing there's the doc if you want to access it and cnc torch table you can start with genealogy actually the latest is 21.08, so that's like number six. <clears throat> and we're going to cut things like shredder parts, tractor parts, track, tractor track parts. Uh, what else? That, those are the immediate things, and a bunch of the heavy equipment parts like backhoes and things. Uh, this is a critical tool. Um, here's the genealogy for the torch table. Okay. What did we do so far? So last time, actually, if you, I don't know if you had a chance to review the, the lesson from last time, the, the video um, design lesson, we said, let's make this thing highly replicable, better than last time. I, mean, I think the universal axis is already a, a great start. We've been working with it for a long time. We've built a lot of the 3D printers, torch tables, even the two-inch axis thing works. We're streamlining. So the new design guidelines, guidelines were to make everything even more transparent. Like uh, from the build perspective, everything is accessible, transparent. Like bolts, you can take things apart. No hidden bolts, not even hidden nut catchers. Like nut, nut catchers means you've got a nut inside the 3D printed plastic piece. Um, you know, comparing, so you got your small machine like CNC circuit mill. This is a thing from last time. Uh, for example, here we had nut catchers inside the 3D printed pieces on the XYZ motion system. Uh, remo removing that, we're making simpler. Uh, one, one big change is we're turning these clamshell pieces from two pieces to one piece. That's another ma major change. Um, not underhanging this like right here, but actually we're going to do it properly, which means you, you span the X, the Y axis. Uh, here I kind of have it reversed. It should really be the Y axis here. Uh, should be X the way we if we use the same convention as on a 3D printer. So the typically the double Y <coughs> single X, uh, not underslung. Put the X in between the Y axes uh, this time around. Um, things like that. Last time we <coughs> we <coughs> started with some design rules and started designing. Um, so you can take a look at some of the design guidelines. But main things: everything accessible no hidden bolts, interconnectability of X to Y to Z in various configurations, use one inch rods. So here's the product. So this is actually Ken did this now. So this is um, Ken's work here. Um, this is the new carriage piece here. Bearings go inside there. So now you can download the files. Here's the, the idler piece. And uh, let's take a look at those. So, so what are the next steps? We're looking at, well, one of the main design cons considerations is you look at some of the dimensions here. 
5.5 inches, so it's printable on a, on a 6 inch bed. Here it's also like that, uh, smaller than 5.5, one inch rod, one inch rod sizes, and so forth. So let's look at more of the dimensions, look at the idler, great. Uh, you can look at can log. Uh, he's actually printed some of these, so we can study the progress there. So here's some of the actual prints. So this is what the idler looks like when built. So what we did there was, uh, the idler is just simply a, the belt runs around it. It's the third piece of the universal axis. Like there's the motor piece, the carriage, the idler piece. Uh, here we put, in this configuration, the things to note are part redundancy. So, okay, bolts, yes the kind of bolts we use already. Uh, this this bolt here is actually, this one here clamps down on the rod, so you can fix the rod if you insert the rod. Here we're using the M8 bearing. M8 shaft, what's that? Well, that's the same materials on the 3D printer, so we're just reusing parts. Uh, M8 bearings, these are roller blade, roller skate bearings, very standard, 20 cents each easy choice. And what we're doing here, you can 3D print an idler for the belt to go around. It's 15 millimeter belt, but we just use the the pulley that we use on the motor. That's one way to do it. We can also just 3D print a, a part here, which is just goes on, on a shaft. And how do you locate this? Well, it's press fit. So if this rubs against the sides, you're good. If the bearings are right next to it is actually the press fit of the bearings locates the idler if the bearings are touching against the, the uh, this idle, the this pulley here. So this is self-locating. Uh, don't even need like set screws or anything. Um, that's that. Um, that's good stuff that's very simple. Now there's some, some missing things here like all this is all good. This is uh, the, I just noticed things, details like 94.6 millimeters for the, the spacing between the rods. Well, make it like 95, make it around or something like that. Um, cool. Uh, print time, 2 hours, 12 minutes, 1.2 millimeter nozzle, 20% infill, 92 grams. Great. Two hours later, we got uh, an idler piece. Uh, so now we look at the carriage. Piece. So first of all, you can actually you know, download these files. You can take a look at these things. So that's the that's the cans work here. Uh, and we did this little flange here because um, the pulley we use it's a little wider than allowed by this 40 millimeter distance from side to side. There you go. Let's open up a carriage. So I actually took a look at the carriage and the idler piece as if you were to join them. So immediately you see some things missing, like there's no way to join this carriage. How do you join it? There's nothing on this side here. I would like to see bolt holes. Uh, so what's the easiest way to do it? Where's my... Maybe that. Maybe this here. Yeah. Uh, bolts, bolt holes need to go through here. Like, okay, so if you have this right now, you can see some things that are immediately obvious, like you can't join these together, but uh, there's a quick solution. Build this up to, to so that the piece goes all, all the way to the 5.5 inches, like this piece here. So you've got this 5.5 inches, uh, or 140 millimeters. Uh, I'm gonna go to preferences. Imperial decimal. Uh, so here the, the deal is if you extend this this idler piece up to span over these bolt holes, you've got access to ready bolt holes. And then you, you put those bolt holes into this piece. Um, so this is really good actually. It's like this is almost too simple. It's a it's a block, you get some bolt holes. You don't really need these ones here either. Like if you just have the top ones and the bottom ones, that would be enough to join a piece like this here. Um, if you wanted to join at a right angle, you would put three holes here and three holes there, but that wouldn't really work. So 
we're kind of constra constraining ourselves to this this kind of a vertical alignment here. What else to say about this? Um, it's one piece, so it's like there's no bolts. Like if you just want to insert the bearings now here. Um, so bushings, what are what do we do there? So that's one inch rod hole, right? But you need a bearing surface in there. And that, so it's Ken's not not in there. But the thing is, if you notice what's going on in this this one here, that's a one inch hole. That's for one inch rods. Uh, this is supposed to be a carriage. That means you need bearings in there. Simplest way to do bearings would be to take this side and poke out 1.25 for the length of the bearing. So what's the bearing look like? Go to the torch table work. There is a bearing there. That's what a bearing looks like. Download that thing. It's McMaster car part, one inch bronze bronze bushing. That works for as a good lighting surface. It's like a couple of dollars. Uh, so you can download this and insert it, but you'll see that its diameter is 1.25. So, we're, so what we're, what's happening here is we're taking common off-the-shelf parts and we're building around them. So, if we want to import the bearing here, file merge it. What's it look like? It looks like that. So you see, it's a little bigger than um, the hole. The, the inner diameter is one inch, but the outer is a little bigger. So, if you want to insert it in here, we'd have to take some meat out of here. So you would go into part design and and put a sketch on that face uh, and get me a 1.25 for press fit. You could press fit this thing, but no, you want to do a closure. So, uh, so this thing is going to be uh, just. I'm just adding bearings here in real time. So if the diameter is 1.25, um, 0.6125 would be the, the radius. And that would be a tight fit, so maybe do like, do that, just a little more. Um, but if you do this, uh, then you have a bearing, a bearing hole, so we'd we could pocket that, for example, uh, to the length of the bearing. What's the bearing length? 1.25. Is it? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's about 1.25, one and a quarter if you get more specific here. Yeah, it's 1.25. So, in other words, this pocket here that we just pocketed out last, you want to do that 1.25. So there we go, we've got a bearing hole. Uh, if you put the bearing in there, what happens? Uh, you need to keep it there. How do you keep it there? The standard technique that we used before is the, the universal idler carriage closure. So uh, this could look a little different here. We can use th these bolts here for carriage closure. So say we just did this here. Uh, we already have these bolts here that Ken did. So, and this is all for M6 bolts. They're printed as about 5.5 millimeters. So you actually thread into them. Uh, so the concept here is everything threads in now, you might see the challenge here. If these are 5.5 and you're attaching this idler piece, what you would want to do is take a six millimeter bit and ream these out so that the bolt goes through and starts catching, starts catching threads on the idler here, if that makes sense. So now you can insert this bearing in here, do a closure. So what, what would a closure look like? Um, simple, just put a, put a thing on it that's got... Um, Let's draw one out. That, that would be an XY axis. Um, so what 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 would it look like? It's just a square thing. Uh, put it. I'm just trying to draw draw the closure. Oh, it's right there. And pat it out uh, to like quarter inch or eighth inch like 0.2 maybe there you go poke a hole through that and there's your closure poke a one inch hole it have to would have to be a little bit larger than one inch here why because the rods have to go freely through it so go like 0.55 maybe 
there you go um, and then poke it so you got your you got your um, you got your carriage closure you need some uh, yeah I'm just doing this in real time here but yeah it would look something like this so that's your closure so it allows the rods to go freely through it and then you need the um, appearance uh, I actually drew a feature on this so that's that's not a proper closure that's just, I need to draw a separate piece there because the whole thing lights up here but I just wanted to show the appearance here a little transparency so that's what you got there so we've got this bearing hole in there you got the closure but you, we need to poke some bolts for this closure as little as like maybe this bolt um, see that bolt there and like two bolts there would suffice all you're trying to do is take the bearing make sure you the bearing doesn't fall out as you're sliding the carriage up and down the axis so that's that's just notes about the carriage all right but let's go back to the dock and what else we got so so the results so far are the carriage and an idler we need a motor piece now for a motor piece we talked about how what you need so this is more about the carriage and motor piece just need the mounting pattern for the the, the motor there's little flanges on the motor if you look at the detail so so you can send a bolt right through the back and thread it into the plastic 3d printed piece so that would work those are uh, what's the size of those holes it's like they're like four millimeter I believe something like that so so tiny bolts that go in there um, what else to say so the net what are the next steps um, oh yeah but I was troubled by this thing here uh, that's nine hours for this print <clears throat> we want to take out some meat from it just optimize it um, the constraint here is you want to be able to carry like a hundred pounds or so on so these two carriages support the y axis the sorry the x axis so the, this is a y carriage like we have here so what do we do here oh that's already there what do we do here i mean we can start doing like brute force means like take this side and just cut out a bunch of meat from it cuz what do you need you need uh well we could cut out this whole middle we don't need this middle. And you save yourself some material there. I mean, literally, you just poke right through it. And do you still have enough structure is the question at the end of the day. There you go. That's our new carriage. It's going to be faster to print, yes. Um, what else could we do here? We could take out... I mean, we could go. The, the question is like, once you print it, you'll see how strong this is. But I'm seeing, okay, that's still like an inch or two. Um, you know, you probably got like an inch and a half here, inch and a half here. So that's still solid. Like you have to have enough meat to to make this very structural, so you can hold. Like, if you got a hundred pounds to hold, uh, so this would definitely help you. But we just might want to start cutting out around. I don't know, like a little more. Uh, to the point where um, it still works but this is like the major thing I could see right now so for example if you were to file export so export this file to an STL you, you go that's the workflow for going into Cura you go file name would be carriage 2 ah, didn't save it right um, export the thing you want to do is this is like rapid prototyping immediately you want to check okay how much time is it going to take me to print save that I, I would go into Cura let's see do I have Cura and this is using lulzbot Cura, which you can download the Cura.app image. It's on a wiki. You can. Uh, so this is the Cura, the old Cura from Lulzbot, which is the best thing you can find for Linux. 
Uh, but here you can do this carriage and you can observe print time. So right now it says eight hours. Well, cool. It's all right, we could probably take out a little more here and there, like uh, we can cut out a little more. But uh, when we actually, yeah, it's got that one of the carriage closures there, but um, yeah, I mean, you have to have enough s substance so it's definitely solid and, and it's not gonna move anywhere. But we can still keep going at it and we can, you know, maybe we just stay at eight hours and you know, print this and there we go. It's 300 grams, so it's like a third of a spool of filament. Still doable. Cost you like five bucks if you buy spools at like 16 bucks or so. Um, so that's pretty good. So after this, say we get to the, okay, so we got the carriage, we modify it. Uh, next steps, we want to wire up. So if we're going to use ramps for controlling larger stepper motors, uh, we can use our universal controller to do this. That's the whole point. Uh, so how do you do this? Uh, let's talk about this for a second. So you can see this reference here, which goes to the wiki. How do you wire up TB666? Okay, this, these are larger, what, what's going on here? So the ramps get you uh, these small stepper drivers that run small motors. Now you can use external stepper drivers such as the TB6600. Uh, there's a full reference design, not only reference design, but open source version here. This is the open source version of it. You can mill it, say on a D3D CNC circuit mill, but you can make one of these stepper drivers yourself too, if you like. Um, if you buy them, they cost like $8. You can make these. Uh, this is actually open source. We got the guy who did this from the Fab Labs to actually open source it. Um, so you got your boards here. It's, it's, it's a kind of a simple thing. It's a few components you can solder by hand. Uh, cool, but that's an open source version of a TB6600. You Google TB6600. Has anyone in the audience here worked with TB6600? Um, maybe have not. Maybe not. Uh, but this is like industry standard stuff. These come in a size. This, this is the particular one, Toshiba 6600. It's the one that can go up to like four amps or so. Uh, there's larger ones if you want to use larger stepper motors, but that's that's the thing. So this, what you see here with the green and black, is an encapsulated version of what I just showed here. Encapsulated meaning a case around it, but basically you've got this chip here, this chip here with this big heat sink, and then a circuitry around it to make it work. But yeah, um, that's that's the idea there. Uh, you get these stepper drivers off the shelf. Here I'm showing how do you how do you wire this up? So you take off one of the so so you got the idea is that the ramps board pr produces signal. You can feed that signal into the stepper driver, and that stepper driver outputs power to the larger steppers. So the steps here are take the universal controller. So this is what you have on a say the 3D printer. Remove the X driver. Remove one of these. Uh, take off one of those things. Uh, so now you have signal, you have, you put little leads, like for example, phone wire, like that's cat five solid core cable, like, or just any jumpers, you, you put them into the corresponding holes. Like just look at this picture here, um, on the first step of drive. So yeah, this upper right, upper right most pin, this one, this one, this one, um, but that's that's how it works. Just, you can follow this diagram, and, and it's basically three signals and then one ground. Like the the, the black here is ground, so you got um, on a step driver you got the labels like pulse, direction, and enable. So you need three 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 wires. You need the pulse because what the stepper how the stepper works is gets a bunch of short pulses of of um, of signal. <clears throat> like it's on off. Like stepper stepper motors work by on off control of successive windings in a stepper motor. So here, like, you need enable, direction, and step. Like, how fast the steps are going, which direction, like, positive or negative, like, counterclockwise or clockwise, and enable, it just enables the thing. 
Um, so, so, so if there's a programmer here, we can take, so ramps already with Marlin, the, the firmware for the 3D printer already has this stuff built in for how you control stepper motors, but you can program it using a simple program by simply saying, like feeding these three signals. So you take, you draw yourself a little Arduino program that says, that basically says on, off, on, off rapidly in a particular sequence. And that actually, that's actually what makes the stepper motor run. And you can figure out, not figure out, I mean, this is all documented like, okay, a stepper driver, just, just for people who want to get into this stepper driver sequence, um, You'll see, um, probably see like a bunch of diagrams that show, like it's effectively this, it's like you're turning one set or the other set of windings on and off with a particular phase. So you do that through, you can write yourself a little program in Arduino, which basically says, turn, turn this output on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. And then you have this other other uh, output. You got to turn it. Well, actually, no. You don't, you don't need to go at that level. It's uh, because you've got the pulse step, like, pulse or step direction enable. Like all, all you need to do is give it a particular pulse. So it means on off cycle direction. It's like I don't know what that is. It's either high or low. Um, uh, point being, if you Google this, you can you can figure out what. Just write a very simple Arduino program. That's like stems stem material. Like how do you control a stepper motor? Um, like more at a lower level. Like actually writing a program to do it. It's doable. But Rams does it for us. Marlin does it for us. So we don't have to worry about that. That's in the bowels of the code already. Okay. Um, so to use a stepper, the external stepper, we remove the stepper driver, the small one. You connected wires to the big one. That's that's called it. You're just extracting a signal pulse from the RAMS board, and then pump it into the TB6600 by connecting these wires. Now on the other side is the power. So you wire yourself a power supply. So basically here what I did was I cut and pasted one half of this diagram here. So uh, if you look at this diagram here on the wiki, uh, no, that's the wrong one. Um, this one here, the reference here. The top part here is the signal side and the high high voltage side here. So this is where the power supply connects to on the bottom. And on the top you have the signal side. So that's what I did here. This is the signal side and on the bottom is the power side. So you, you take a little 12 or 24 volt power supply. These stepper drivers work anywhere up to like 40 volts. So you can take 12, 24, or 36 volts. Uh, they all work pretty much. The, the higher the voltage, the, the better response, like the higher top speed you'll get. Um, but you power it up according to these leads, like you put power in, plus minus, and then the four leads to this actual stepper. So you get your stepper motor, it's got four leads on the back of it, you just wire them into those terminals. Um, and we did that the way it looks in practice. We did this our, our uh, CNC torch table genealogy. In practice, it looks like um, that, that's what it looks like in practice. It's this, when you wire everything up to the universal controller, it ends up looking something like this. So, so here's the ramps. Um, can't see it in there, but basically we took out all the stepper drivers here. We put, put in the external ones, uh, and you connect those four wires from each of those stepper, stepper driver slots into the, these TB6600 stepper drivers with those terminals. You connect the power supply to them. And that's kind of it. And you can still use the you can use the universal controller. You've got the LCD screen, the power supply, and all the infrastructure that's already on a 3D printer. Now this is turned into a CNC torch table controller like this. So it's very convenient to use the same parts. Um, next steps. Um, let's talk about the next steps for for the crew here. Uh, so here we talked about this detail. We got to make the attachment between uh, carriage and idler. We need to create the motor side. Uh, so for wiring up the, the stepper driver, like all you need is a, uh, um, you can do that like from the printer controller right now by, you need the TB6600. 
hardware, just the one of the external drivers, you need a power supply, and you need some wires. That's all. Um, if I miss anything, I mean, in our diagrams, it's like, you got the stepper driver, you got the motor, power supply, wires, that's it. Okay, so that, that's something we can do like right now and actually start controlling larger stepper motors, which is cool because now we have the ability to run larger machines. Uh, so either the carriage detail, motor side, um, reduce carriage size. Yeah, this is what I refer to regarding the nine hour print time, reduce nine hour print time maybe. We can play with that a little bit. Carriage closure, I mentioned a little bit about that. Now, we still need the belt attachment and all that, just like on a smaller universal axis. So we've got the pieces, uh, these kinds of pieces. This is what we use on a 3D printer. So this is a belt, belt catcher. This is like the belt peg, like the belt cylinder. Um, what's the easiest way to do the belt cylinder? Like the belt catcher, because this is now 50 millimeter belt instead of six millimeter belt. Well, just enlarge it lengthen it and the same design would still work so even if you go on to the go into say uh, you go into Cura <laughs> you have the ready ability to do that right there you can download for example um, you can download the D3D Universal CAD part of of the belt peg like say you know, say you do that here and you this belt peg here you download that <coughs> And you can do it, you don't even have to modify, you can go just, so you get your belt peg to print. What do you do there? You just click on it and then scale it up in the Z direction. So make it like, if it was good for 16, for 15 millimeter, you're going to need like 2.5. And there you go, there's your longer belt peg. Something like that. Uh, but now you got all this, <laughs> this, this is like too crazy here. So, um... This could work, but it's it's a little too long. So probably just redesign this, and it's just a cylinder with a hole in it. So you, that that's easily doable. Chamfered on the edge, but yeah, that that hole there should be about 15 millimeters for the belt, and we've got too much. We can like cut it off like halfway here and there, um, but that's a way, a simple way to do your larger belt peg. And then the carriage closure. Well, we can use exactly what we have before, except you'd have to once again because the belt is much wider this if you use the reference design from the before make the uh, make this slit here just longer so it can accept the 15 millimeter belt so that there will be the design change there uh, and then you need to add the carriage closure as I talked about belt clamp uh, so a convenient way here so so these are now 40 like if you look at in our CAD here one of the critical dimensions is okay how wide is it it's about 40 millimeters if you look at this or 1.5 inch so now you can use two inch bolts or 50 millimeter m6 bolts as the interconnecting uh, interconnecting part um, so if you were to um, see where's my so if you have the let's see let's merge well if I have the either here on nah, I'll get rid of that one where's my idler there so if you screw in from the back once again if we extend this piece so these bolt holes actually work um, you use a 50 millimeter bolt. Now, 50 millimeter is convenient. That's easy. It's two inch. You get it at the hardware store. Uh, cool thing is you can use M6 or a quarter inch. The threading does not mind. Six millimeter compared to 6.25 millimeter. That's what quarter inch is. Quarter inch is 6.25 millimeter or something close to that. Uh, both bolts would work. So this is readily accessible for off the shelf hardware. Uh, if you use a two inch bolt. So now, if you have a two inch bolt though, and this is 40 millimeters, then you're threading in only 10 millimeters. 
you'd like to thread in a little more so what I would do is I would do a countersink on these things so the bolt actually goes in a little deeper uh, what I would do is so on that face I would countersink it meaning do a pocket around that for the bolt head so now you just uh, yeah you took out some okay there's artifacts there where we're actually starting to run into the other bolt hole that's through the whole thing but that's a recessed hole there and you can if you put a bolt through it uh, you're getting gaining yourself a few millimeters there so that you would thread in maybe like 15 millimeters um, you want to th I would like to see the thread in like maybe like 20 millimeters like close uh, around three-quarter inch so that you make sure that when you thread it in it's not coming out it's a very solid connection I would say about 20 millimeters of thread in would be good so we have to think about bolt and bolt holes now you can use a longer bolt like 60 millimeter or you know two and a half inch or something yes sure we're just trying to use very common parts um, so that's one consideration there as far as, so the idler wants to clamp, uh, just one more thing here, I, what I would modify here is on an idler you want to grab the rod um, by clamping it down. So you can put in a bolt through one of these holes through the side and you've got a little, you've got, there you have about a quarter inch, about six millimeters seven or maybe seven millimeters there where you can grab a bolt onto that but what I would do here make that more solid of a connection so I would build up this side here build this up like this give it a little pad and then poke through it so you've got much more meat if you want to stick a bolt through this so now we're gonna do on this pad here we can go take out the make your 5.5 uh, millimeter hole again uh, so now you've got this protrusion where if you thread in a bolt through that you've got just much more grab on a bolt like a yeah we should shoot for about three quarters at least half an half an inch three qu three quarters I mean we're talking about one inch rods and carrying up to like Forces on an order of a hundred pounds, let's say. Unlike the printer, where the forces are on an order of a few pounds. Uh, so if you put a bolt, a quarter inch bolt, its clamp force through about three quarter inches of plastic, it's like having a nylon washer that's like three quarters long. That's a lot of grab. So. Uh, point is if you put a bolt through this threaded through to the rod that would be here there's a lot of grab there so it's just a point of how you design these things uh, you don't need to make the entire side thicker just put a bump on this to make it work um, yeah but that's getting into the details a lot of the details of how these universal axes work with the the most fundamental one for reference uh, when you when you look at the axis I mean, if you look at this thing, well, that's what we're doing the equivalent of. In this case here, we actually connected pieces through the four four bolt pattern. This is the original one um, with a NEMA 17 motor. I we use these belt pegs. We went away from the belt pegs because they have to be very precise, otherwise it, they fall out or are too tight. But that's the equivalent, and you're kind of thinking, okay, you've got the motor, you've got the idle idler here uh, here we actually use this long idler that's way too long like we shrunk it down since then um, and the carriage with the bearings inside but that's what we're doing for reference just just for reference of what what we're trying to accomplish here uh, so you can make the analogy between one one system and the other and in this system here we had double clamshell so for example here you need these four bolts to clamp it together well that's parts too many parts just make it monolithic is what we did since about a year or two uh, and that's that's how it works uh, so that's a brief overview of one inch universal axis we're just going to larger size and using larger stepper drivers and you can use larger frames and then you've got you're on top of making uh, pretty decent sized machines on order like the, the limit of the one one inch axis would be you can probably do very easily 
uh, I would keep it at four feet by four feet uh, and eight feet tall is easy if you go to longer lengths like say you want to do still one inch universal axis torch table which is longer than four by four feet use hollow rods they do have one inch hollow rod which is much lighter because the the thing that happens is with one inch solid rods they end up sagging we did a torch table uh, that was like 10 feet long and uh, to show you that one d3 cnc torch table the one two versions ago like this one um you don't see the detail here but those are actually um we switched the long rods which were 10 feet to hollow uh, because they ended up sagging too much on this this five foot these were actually six feet so yeah six feet is actually pretty good but once you get to this 10 foot it actually starts sagging and they start vibrating too much so uh, and we did this one here still with a small stepper motors and a small belt but doubled so we have double six millimeter belt for 12 12 millimeter and this works you can move this thing around um but it gets um uh, wobbly once you get to the large distances the solution is hollow one inch rod it does exist uh the, the amount of force that it can hold if you've got a configuration like here like say two two sets of axes on the on the x that's still strong enough to hold a torch head which is non-contact but this one inch universal yeah that wouldn't work if you are actually milling that's way too little force like with milling forces um you can't use i wouldn't use the one inch rod more than like uh four feet if you're doing milling like i'm not talking light milling like maybe wood or something um that would be kind of the limit but still decent so and then the larger larger end of this scale if you want to do cnc machines that are heavy duty then go to two inch or three inch rods so that would be the thing and the two inch as, as i showed here somewhere there's two inch you can look up two inch which we did elsewhere okay uh, so that's about it uh, any questions on the on a universal axis of one inch and what's happening here is we're just refining the last version and, and modifying it to uh, just easier build easier everything Uh, no questions. Just uh, really looks good. The 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 monolithic parts, aside from the clamshells. I mean, I think that's uh, definitely going to be easier to do. Mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah. Definitely easier. Print times aren't bad. We just might want to optimize the the carriage part, which is one of the larger parts. And uh, when we print it, you you'll feel like how strong it is, like when you actually build it. So, I mean. You can do finite element analysis on this thing and it will tell you certain things but I think the reality is if you do a rapid bit you know just print yourself one of the pieces and and see how much how much material is necessary to make it hold still that's kind of like the in a rapid prototyping sense that's what you want to find out because I mean it looks good on paper here um, this is You know, when we rip this out, it looks good. We can't really tell by looking at it. Like physically, once you print it, you'll you'll see everything about it. It'll be very clear whether this is strong or it's going to break or break or not. Because um, that those that kind of information you get readily from once you actually build it. So yeah, yeah. Today we'll um, we'll actually get out the large stepper drivers here. Um, if you want to replicate this experiment at home, if you have a universal controller. <laughs> Uh, well, if you want to use the kind of RAM system from another 3D printer to actually run larger machines, you can. If it's running Marlin, you can readily control other machines. So all you need to go is go to Amazon.com or someplace like that, and you Google up TB6600, and you can get one of these things. In units of single layer, they're more like, you know, like 10 or 20 bucks, but in units of multiple, they're like eight bucks each. Uh, you need a 12 or 24 volt power supply. 
amps like one of these. Um, you're running four amps per motor. So if you've got however many, if you say you got five, you need 20 amps. So a 30 amp power supply like this does it. And beyond that is some wire. Uh, cat, like solid Cat5 wire is, I mean, just a standard Ethernet cable like this, just break yourself a cable and you've got the little in interconnect wires for the leads. Now these small wires, um, they're fine for the signal wires just from a regular phone cable, rip up a phone cable and you've got solid core. If you've got the stranded version, it's hard to put it into the, the holes of the, um, the stepper driver on the ramps, so you need solid, solid wire like this. Because this, this kind of wire comes in solid or stranded, like multiple tiny strands, which would just fray if you try to connect that to the ramps. Unless you put like a terminal on the wire, you, uh, you can't just use it straight in. Uh, but yeah, the, the stranded would work as well if you crimp the end with something like a ferrule or just some kind of termination that keeps it all together and still fits inside the driver, um, small driver holes on the ramps. Okay, so if you want to do this at home, this definitely, uh, you can still do this and it would work. We'll, we'll build one of the, the drivers here because uh, as we go into Summer X, we're, we're going to be building a bunch of the one inch universal axes so that we want to have ready control and good experience with uh, like everybody here uh, knowing how to run that. All right, and that's about it. Uh, the hole, the question, I'm looking at the question from Joshua, pre-drill holes in the rods through the other side. Sure, you can do that, but that's drilling in metal. That's pretty hard. You can do it. It's just much more work if you want to go that route as well. But if you had the constraint where you only have that much space around the, for example, the idler piece and we're idler or motor, and you, you are absolutely constrained. You can't get that extra length to put in that good uh, bump as we showed. If you pre pre-constrained by space issues, yeah, then actually drilling a hole through and putting a pin through like that, would, yeah, you, that would make sense in that case. But otherwise, if you have the space available, um, no need. Um, yeah, there's you can import things like uh, the libraries for Arduino to run step or more. So this is all kind of like the STEM DIY stuff. Um, yeah, and it's it already, already, Arduino already supports just about everything. So yeah, you can run stepper motors with Arduino. Uh, it will be useful to get some reference programs that we can actually put onto the, the ramps that we use. Uh, so instead of Marlin, we can upload other reference programs that allow us to um, yeah, to control steppers. Uh, for example, if we want to run many, many more steppers uh, with an Arduino, yes, we could do it without a problem. This might be uh, jumping a little bit ahead, but uh, does the controller also control the actual torch head um, on and off? Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at the the controller here. What else do you have? Already on the board you have a bunch of outputs. Like for example you have three outputs here. Those are outputs. They control the heaters, the bed, and the fans. So already you have a set of three outputs. So what we're going to do is one of them could control gas turn on and there's three gases. It's three. We need three solenoids. There's three solenoids that are here all together on the torch head. They can be run with those three outputs there. Um, you can turn on an igniter. The igniter we would turn on with a solid state relay. The igniter is essentially like a neon light power supply, um, but that's a 120 volt device it's, um, shown here. Uh, we actually mounted this on the back of this um, back other side. We have the igniter part. So yeah, this controls. The point is that you have access 
to a bunch of pins. Like here, these are already pre-wired terminals that you can use. Okay, turn something on and off. You can use these through directly for small loads, like if it's like a couple amp load, like for example, this the last one, like the D10 outlets there, they can support a couple of amps. So if you wanted to control one of those relays for gas right from that, you can go straight out of that. Now the other terminals, they're, they're like, I think lower amps, or I don't know if they can support two amps even, but uh, if they don't, you go through another power element like a relay. This is a solid state relay here that we use for heat. Uh, you can run the wires into solid state relay and then control other things. There's also like, all the pins that are available there. There's a bunch of pins that are still free and you can use those as signal pins for other turn on and turn off. You've got access to three uh, sensors immediately, like temperature sensors on the ramps. So if you're building something like a brick press, <laughs> I mean, you can do, you can have sensor inputs, like, um, like whether it's say the, the filament maker where you have to turn on a heater and turn on the motor, you can run this, you can run a brick press with this. Uh, so you can basically take any pins that are liberated, they're still free, not used. There's a whole bunch on the ramps that you can still use, so you can run uh, a lot of different things from this. So in our current iteration, we, we do have the ability to turn on all the gases and the igniter through the ramps. So it's, it's very convenient, just an easy way to uh, turn on a bunch of stuff. That's why we call this the universal control, because you can have multiple inputs and outputs uh, through the same thing that already controls the printer and the already built-in ability to control stepper motors and larger stepper motors. So it's like, what else do you need? You need inputs, you need to control things as signals through outputs that you can run through uh, power handling elements like transistors or solid state relays or mechanical relays. So yeah, um, that's all we need. Very cool. Yeah, uh, with the LCD, you can program that to to say, okay, now this is the torch table program firmware. So that's for programmers, like uh, anybody who wants to help us with that, we can do it. Otherwise, you can use the exact, like right now, uh, just running Marlin, the G code that you do for the two-dimensional motion, you can run this exactly with the Mar Marlin firmware. You can run exactly the same 3D printer code and you can be cutting out parts on the torch table. Uh, it will look like the, you know, the LCD will say 3D printer, but you can readily change that to torch table and use the stock Marlin to control your torch table, things like that. Yeah, so I think, I think that's about all. So I'll come down there, we'll um, take out some of the stepper drivers, larger ones, and we'll, we'll see if we can uh, get those working with a larger motor. And that, that's about it, so we can uh, run the larger machines. Okay, well, thanks everybody. And we'll call this um, Torch Table Design Lesson. We'll go from here, see what we can do today. Okay. Hi, uh, quick question, please. Yes. Uh, could you just run through the procedure to change the um, pre-CAD uh, uh, FCSTD to STL? You know, oh, sure. uh, making solid and com I, I, I keep getting yeah, not so being able to. Yeah, in FreeCAD, first thing is you select an object. Yeah. Go to File Export. And you gotta select SDL, and then you go. Uh, but. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, wait, wait. Uh, don't you have to like combine it and make it into so solid and? Uh, okay, uh, so it that. depends. Yeah. It depends. So here, observe what we have. So when you double click on it, effectively what you're looking for is you just see that everything is lit up. So in other words, this pocket here contains all the information. So yeah, mm -hmm. you can go like, you can export this as a sim simple object, but no, you don't need to do that as long as you have everything selected. And if it's in multiple parts, you can go into the part tree 
and then select multiple parts by hitting control. So say you did have more pieces that were part of the object you want to print. What I'm doing right now is holding down control and selecting other pieces that I would have to add, but not here. You don't have to. Um, could you, could you uh, say do it with the um, with the carriage piece? Yeah. So we we open up carriage. I uh, I'm gonna go to. So we go from scratch. We go to. 2108 we go to CAD I want to I'm going to download my carriage okay click on that so now I'm going to open the carriage so in the carriage if you look at the part tree you've got all these pockets but see they're hidden the only one that's live is that one so if you double click on this thing, you select the whole thing, Boom. right? Yeah. You might be getting confused, like maybe if you've got that, you know, if you select that, or maybe if you've got both of these selected. I don't know. So now I, in the part tree, I selected both of these. I don't have to select this one because this one, the last one already contains all the all the stuff. Um, but yeah, just double click on it file export select SDL and then carriage oh. that's it then you got you got this this carriage here you can go into Q, Cura Fuse Ultimaker Cura <clears throat> No, but yeah, use the use the Lulzbot Cura. That's better. So yeah, if you dump it into there, there it is. Yeah. Uh, Kenny, you notice that you don't have the bearing holes in here, right? So this is in progress. The bearing spacer, the bearing. Um, this is one inch rod, right? So you are in process yeah. still. Yeah. Uh, so, so that the holes would actually have to be bigger than one inch. Yeah, it fits to accommodate the bearing. The bearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, then that throws off the um, the holes, the attachment holes, maybe. No, it's okay. It's still okay. I just did this. So. Um, I just did this here. No, not this. Um, Uh, let's see. You can take out. Yeah, okay. You can work with it. What I would suggest actually is do. So before we had a carriage, you slip in the bearings from the same side. Here, what I would do is I would cut out your your cut for the bearing here, and then cut it out from the other mm -hmm. side and use multiple closures. That's easy, so that. You don't have this long hole in there because then you would need a spacer between the two bearings. Oh. Yeah, so just cut out a hole uh, of one and a quarter inch. Uh, review this video. I think you joined a little later, but if you re review this video, yeah. I showed how to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So that's that's good work. It's. Uh, I mean, this is like. Um, it's almost too simple it's it's like oh man this is so easy it starts looking almost too easy uh, after looking see because before we had the double clamshells we had like the magnet holes we had like all these complications like, like right now it's just this is just getting stripped down to the essential features which is good so that if we need to modify it one easy way to do it is you know modify the existing pieces to a different version for a specialized purpose don't don't need to do one thing that does everything but if we make the design very transparent easy then it's very easy to modify to different applications so that's good I like it any other questions or we can get going
Yeah. Okay. So let's get going and uh, hopefully we got some large steppers running today. All right. So I'll quit here. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Thanks, Martin.